Very well, then let us get started. First of all, this is a very important meeting. It is a meeting of friends, a gathering of colleagues who have known each other for some time. So I would like to note that I am extremely pleased to share with you today in which we will be presenting the special edition of CEPAL Review number 132. But it is a special edition dedicated to the COVID-19 pandemic pandemic, and particularly to analyze the socioeconomic crisis that has occurred in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as the globe, and to look at specific elements of this crisis. Today, ECLAC's Deputy Executive Secretary Mario Timoli and I, and of course, Mario will also be moderating our extremely enriching exchange of ideas as the editors of this. I would like to thank Eduardo Sulkel and others who have joined us or asked us rather to join them as editors of this edition of the review. We also have with us today distinguished authors of some of the articles compiled in this issue. And we are very pleased to have them with us here today. I'd like to speak to each of them quickly. First, our dear Jose Antonio Ocampo, who was Executive Secretary of ECLAG, was Under Secretary General of the Department of Policy and Social Affairs of the UN ECOSOC. And today he is at Columbia University and the chair of the committee there. I know that he is an early riser. He gets up at 4 a.m. to write. I've always been impressed by that. But here he is with his tremendous contribution to this edition. Let me also recognize Benedict de Bull, professor at the Center for Development and Environment at the University of Oslo, Norway. It has been a pleasure to share with you at the University of Oslo and to recognize you for everything that you've done in the area of inequality. I'm also pleased to recognize Francisco Robles Rivera, researcher at the Institute for Social Research and the professor of the School of Communication at the University of Costa Rica. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Also, we have Leonardo Lomi Vanegas, professor at the School of Economics of the National Un Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. And of course, that is my alma mater, and it is a th pleasure to have you. Also, Maria Savona, professor of economics of innovation at the uh, Science and Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. She's also a professor of applied economics at the Department of Economics and Finance of Luis University, Rome. Our dear Juan Carlos Moreno Brid, who we miss dearly, but he is a professor at the School of Economics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and who will be joining us to talk about the repercussions in Central America also, Rodrigo Alonso Mores Lopez, postdoctoral researcher, also at UNAM, will be joining us. I trust, Miguel, that I haven't overlooked anyone. For Mario and for me, it has been a pleasure and an honor to join this team in seeking to explain the health crisis and why specifically it has had a greater socioeconomic impact in Latin America and the Caribbean, because we are the hardest hit in the developing world. Of course, India with this new variant is rising above our levels, but until very recently, our region with 8.3% of the population was at a very, very high level in terms of the death rate. So what we can see is that it is not happenstance that Latin America and the Caribbean is being hit hard by the pandemic. 
the truth is that Latin America has pre-existing conditions and structural gaps that have not been addressed over the course of history. And this is, of course, what we are suggesting in this article, that these are the result of the development style prior to the pandemic that have led to the persistence of asymmetries that are internal and also particularly vis-a-vis -vis the more developed countries in this new dimension, which is the environmental dimension that we certainly cannot overlook because this is the result of the misuse that we have made of our natural resources in the biosphere. So what we have been doing and since what we've been doing since the beginning of this session is to look at these three factors in a, an integrated fashion, the external view, looking at the inequality, which is the second point in terms of the perspective of Latin America and the Caribbean and the environment in terms of the re carbon reduction specifically. In this context, we have the three gaps that we have been looking at, and we have described how the perspectives for progress can only come together if we bring together these three conditions in a growth rate of 4%. That is what we were suggesting, but the, the, we have to have preconditions that are uh, very clear. We have to look at the 1% of the richest and the poorest year by year, because this also is beginning to be a necessary debate. We also need to decarbonize our economies. And thirdly, to strengthen our productive capabilities. The progressive changes, the so that we don't depend so much externally. I would like today to note that, of course, that where we stand, we have over 57% of domestic debt at the central level. We have to allocate 59% of our exports to service that debt. This is unacceptable. The debt and our exporting capability of our countries all of this poses a series of problems for us that are of the utmost importance. And ECLEC in this context is uh, obviously picking the winners is not the best policy, but we believe that there are sectors that can help this transition better from the energy transition, from bioeconomics, from the circular economy, from the digital, economy, we have looked at what has been seen in the creation of the digital footprint and the manufacturing industry that we are also looking at in terms of, for example, the analysis we're doing of the vaccines. We can see that our region could produce vaccines if we had, I mean, we do have the installed capacity, but we need to be able to do so. Onam, Brazil, Argentina, certainly there are capacities and capabilities to produce. So that's why we thought about this special edition of the magazine within the context of the sanitary crisis, health crisis. And apart from what ECLAC is saying, why don't we invite colleagues that can offer different perspectives? Because there's no doubt that COVID has unleashed a severely acute crisis in global capitalism. That's why it's so important to us since the Great Depression of 1930. And it's important to have this discussion with you to see what is happening because in structuralist literature, which ECLAC has studied and addressed and written about, it. it we analyze why this development 
style is so dysfunctional in our region and in the world, of course. And the pandemic has brought this out into the open, informality, the lack of productivity, um, all these many, many shortcomings. And we find ourselves in a good standing to analyze this. The, the region has contracted by 4.1. And we will never return to the level of activity that we had pre-pandemic. And of course, the vaccines are not all effective or there is no guarantee and that opens many uncertainties for us for the future. And of course, we will have even more gaps especially in the peripheral areas. That's what we believe. I just wanted to say that as a backdrop, we believe that this magazine addresses all these concerns and questions of how this global phenomenon is going to impact the short term in terms of employment growth. It has been on Unprecedented. We have 44 million people unemployed in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's because not everyone is looking for employment, then it would be higher. And of course, the most affected is all uh, is always our women. And that is also addressed in some of the articles presented today. So we believe that the best minds in our region have brought to you the set of thinkers and researchers that are helping us think about the different answers that we can find to address the health crisis in the short term, but also to address what will happen with the economy post pandemic. What will happen to how production is organized globally with finance. What will happen with all this? Will they be disruptive factors? Where are we heading? This is all part of what we would like to reflect on today with all of you. Of course, ECLAC has attempted to contribute by means of its history. And we have set specific topics on the table to address inequality for over a decade. And I would say it is the core of our search to resolve some of these issues. And inequality is at the core of development, not only as a result of the same. I believe there's a change of paradigm here in thought processes. This has been proposed by ECLAC since 2010. Equality, structural change for equality. It is necessary to have this basic change from inefficiencies and inequality. And the last one has been on building a better future for a transformative change. And that's where we analyzed the model with the three gaps. So before the pandemic, this number was already a milestone and it is extremely important for us here at ECLAC. It will help us define what we need to do at ECLAC to continue to support the region and to analyze the different um, perspectives of the emergency and also to help devise a development model. And we have an extractive model that is based on a culture of privilege. We would like to offer our readers 14 articles with a huge diversity of information, of policies that allows us to better understand this health crisis from a historical and, and global perspective, regional perspective, to see how we can address this with fiscal policies, social policies, economic policies. So thank you very much for being here, my dear colleagues. It is a pleasure to hear from all of you. And I am very, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have you all here as always. You are our teachers. All of you have been at least 
my teacher and it has been a pleasure to count on you here at this institution. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to offer the floor to Mario Cimoli, who will lead the debate. Thank you, Alicia. As you said, it's a pleasure to have you all here with us here. Alicia mentioned that we have a significant number of very prestigious writers addressing extremely significant topics from the historical perspective, from macroeconomy, the digital impact, the smaller uh, countries, from the perspective of poverty, gender. So we've addressed all topics and it is a very important uh, number. It's, it's somewhat politically incorrect. And these numbers here at ECLAC give us some pleasure. It, it is a pleasure for me and for the entire team at ECLAC to achieve this. And today we have Antonio Benedicta, Juan Carlos, Jose Antonio, and we will hear from Jose Antonio and from Benedict on inequality and poverty. Then Leonardo also touched on uh, health and economy, Maria Savona, the digital aspects. And it is so complex and has so many uncertain results that it's very difficult to have a clear perspective. Juan Carlos has the macro economies, the Central American economies. So we will hear about the migration pressures and this article it hits the nail on the head. So we will all you will all have 10 minutes. And after that, our um, Secretary General will offer a words of uh, closing. So I would like to offer the floor first to Jose Antonio and um, you have the floor. Thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this number. Thank you for inviting me to participate here today. Fortunately, uh, another meeting I had was moved and um, I will have to leave 10 minutes earlier to attend the other event. I would like to offer a presentation that summarizes some of these elements. It is based on, on a compare, not so much historical perspective, but more a comparison of the COVID crisis to other past crises. So I'm comparing two long crises that we had in the region, the Great Depression in the 30s and the debt crisis in the 80s, two shorter crises, the Asian crisis at the end of the 20th century and the North Atlantic crisis in 2007 to 2009. That was an international financial crisis. And well, the US and Europe, basically. To this, we need to add the five years prior to the COVID-19 crisis in an article that I wrote before the COVID disaster, I called it the lost half decade because we had already had five years with zero growth, practically speaking. And within this context, I believe COVID-19 is the strongest in history. And there was another crisis at the beginning of the First World War, but not in the Southern Cone. This is the growth data. We have looked at this together with Pertola. It is ECLAC information as well in red, and you can see the Southern Cone. This is the Great Depression, the debt crisis, the Asian crisis, the North Atlantic crisis, and you can see the current crisis, which is the worst in history for the Southern Cone as a result of the drop of the GDP in Latin America. The comparative analysis that I uh, make in the essay 
basically says that these international crises have been strong, but not worse than prior crises. International cooperation has been weak, especially compared with the North Atlantic crisis, but private funding, trade and remittances have behaved relatively well. Therefore, the poor performance of Latin America, I believe, is surprising in itself comes after one of the worst um, quinquennials in history and is important to understand why Latin America has had such a poor performance. This is the figures for the IMF last year from well from March to December. You can see there's 20 countries that uh, benefited from the emergency loans. It's not a lot of money, it's $300 million. And what is truly important is the flexible loans that uh, for Chile, Peru, and Colombia, um, and, and Mexico was approved later, or earlier, excuse me, that's of around $52 million. But these resources are not simply disimbursed. They're partially disbursed for Colombia. Now, in terms of multilateral banking, it's not, hasn't been very fortunate. We have the IDB and CAF who cannot really increase their funding. The World Bank did. The World Bank is the third uh, source of funding for Latin America and the Central American uh, Investment Bank. And we can see that the total investment uh, on loans was quite modest, mainly thanks to the World Bank and uh, lower than we saw in the 2008 to 2009 crisis. You can see the drop in trade at the beginning of the crisis, which was very substantive, very similar to that of 2009, but the recovery was very significant. We, by the end of the year, were recovering our levels that were similar to prior than the crisis. This is something, of course, that reflects the data in Latin America. In the area of basic products and staples, we can see, of course, the question of prices in fuels. When fuels saw a, a slight drop early last year, and then they recovered. So if we look at agricultural products, the, the situation is rather different. So we certainly do see different impacts, whether depending on the market. And of course, in terms of capital market, there has been a dramatic suspension early in the crisis, particularly in March. There was a very sharp downturn, a huge exodus from emerging economies, but the recovery was fairly fast by mid-April. This began to rise again. And while it's taken some, some time since the middle uh, or late last year, the growth really has been very substantive, particularly in shares. And if we compare this to the other crises, we can see that this has been a relatively limited impact. We can also see this in terms of the cost of financing. We can see at the beginning of the crisis, cost of financing rose sharply, but very quickly it fell off much more so than in the crisis of the North Atlantic. And certainly the Asian crisis, I don't have data on screen for that because, well, the, the data was also very hard to come by. But in any case, the impact has been relatively weak. The financing in um, and the bond issue in Latin America, I mean, I don't have the remittance data on screen, but again, as compared to what happened 2009, 2010, 
we saw actually a rise in remittances rather than a reduction. And this is primarily because of the countries that depend on the United States, that is to say the immigrants into the United States remitted or sent back a lot more money to their families during the crisis than previously. So therefore there is not a severe international economic shock. On the contrary, it's relatively weak. So the reasons for the poor performance are national and regional policies. Certainly, of course, there is a topic of health, but obviously we can see that this is also one of the worst five-year periods in history. The Perhaps the, the lost half decade, certainly the worst since, the, since World War II. And after five years of very weak performance compared to the fiscal space in 2009-2010. In this particular case, there was no fiscal space. There certainly are some exceptions. Of course, Chile and Peru are the most interesting exceptions in that case. We have the health impact, 8.4% of the population, some 18% of all cases, 25, 26% of the deaths, and a significant pace of vaccination. This is in the middle of this lost decade. We can see that the five years prior to this were much worse than the years prior to the Asian crisis and certainly prior to the Latin American crisis. So from the data from 1950, which is the year that ECLAC started having data for, this is the worst half decade, which will clearly translate into a lost decade in terms of overall results. Comparatively, if we look at um, statistics from the IMF, as we can also see India, there Latin America continues to be the worst region in development and it is the only one with these uh, features and, and facets. But of course, the pandemic, of course, in India is having tremendous impact. And if we compare ourselves to Western Europe, we're seeing, again, very similar figures. Again, looking at this midst of the lost decade, we see backsliding in poverty. And of course, with this crisis, that has expanded, which leads me to an agenda related to what Alicia was just mentioning. And Alicia was referring to documents in 2000. She mentioned a number of different documents and papers, but oh, these are the elements that need to be on that development agenda. First of all, much more active social policies to overcome the issues of employment, poverty, and inequality in terms of growth, putting diversification of productive structures at the center, supported with ambitious science and technology policies. I would say a regional integration impetus and a depolitization of that, which has been one of the banes of the recent decade. Con counter cyclical macroeconomic policies plus, plus progressive tax reforms to improve the distribution of income and fund national domestic uh, social spending, progress in international commitments, SDGs, and of course, strengthening democratic institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Antonio. A very interesting presentation. The structural aspects continue to be a huge stumbling block for us all. Benedict has already been presented by uh, the Secretary General. The question is the elite. COVID-19, the elites in the future of political economy of inequality reduction in Latin America particularly how the elites have survived. Benedict, tell us about our paper and thank you for being with us here today. 
Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be with you here at ECLAC. I, I haven't been here for a while, so I appreciate this opportunity. I'm going to be presenting the paper in conjunction with Francisco Robles of the University of Costa Rica. Thank you, Alicia, for this very kind introduction. As has been noted, and as some of us may recollect that when the pandemic first started, some people were saying that this was going to be the system that would really put everybody on the same plane, they would level the playing field. But of course, that is not the case. Some are harder hit and the inequalities, of course, are a vulnerability, particularly vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. And that coincides also with the conclusions in the economic literature about the impact of pandemics. In previous pandemics as well, it has been the, the poorest who have suffered the most and that have suffered the greatest inequality. But our concern in this paper is how this pandemic affects policies oriented toward reducing inequality. So we're looking more at political economy. This is a topic, of course, that ECLEC has focused on. There have been a number of different papers on this recently. So the question then is, how does the pandemic affect political economy and inequality reduction? The information is much less conclusive on this note than the necessarily just economic impact of the pandemic. Now, the reasons for this is that the elites have established laws and regulations that allow them to concentrate wealth and to transfer wealth from one generation to the next. Whereas during the crisis, including the pandemic, they focused on the short-term survival and on overcoming or vanquishing their enemies. And the elites therefore have felt pressured to contribute to the lower classes with a long-term impact on the distribution of income. And while this also may come from different periods of growth, as we've seen in 2003, 2013, without a redistribution of assets and the structural changes, these may just be have a short-term impact. Our argument, therefore, is that the results of the future political economy of inequality will depend on the resources that the economic elite actually have and their influence on political and policy institutions. If the crisis essentially transfers resources upward, then we can expect an expansion in inequality as a result. On the other hand, if the crisis requires that the elites pay closer attention to the demands of the non-privileged groups, then we may see a need for restructuring the institutions that will affect the culture of privilege, which Alicia also referred to a moment ago. And this may lead to a reduction in poverty over the long term and an inequality. We've looked at all of the existing data about the distribution of income during the COVID-19. We have used this to identify whether COVID-19 can allow for a better redistribution of resources or whether it will just lead to a transfer of resources 
upwards and a maintenance of the status quo. And that review is what Francisco will be sharing with us. So I will give him the floor. Thank you very much to Alicia Barcena. As Benedicta was saying, we have looked at the data from the interpreter sounded origin is very much wanting. We will do our best. Given the challenges that we have, given the dearth of reliable data, we know where the poor people are, but we don't have specific figures. So the first question is what data is available and noting that we can see that wealth rose around 16% today, it's about 21% among the highest income quintile. If we look at the other side of this, we see two primary problems. First, while the SMEs have suffered the contraction in the economy and confinement has meant that the SMEs have been the primary victim of this pandemic, particularly the poorest citizens, immigrants, young people, and women particularly who, as is rather self-evident, are unable to engage in teleworking. We have also seen that the transfer of wealth is not happening just within the economic elite. We have looked at the dependence of governments on technology platforms and we can see that the growing wealth in that regard could reduce possibilities for establishing a digital tax that many organizations and civil society and others support. And lastly, if we look at the response of the economic elite, especially in Central America, which is always a very interesting laboratory to see what is happening in the region. And we found that it did not appear that there was a willingness among economic elite in Central America to change. So a country such as Guatemala, which has a tax rate of around 12%, one of the lowest in the world, The elite has opposed new taxes and in general, the elite have proposed tax reductions. And the biggest impact, of course, is on philanthropy, corporate philanthropy, which seems to be reflecting the status quo and maintain their social and political capital. In conclusion, I'd like to contribute three topics. First, not all of the elites have benefited similarly from the crisis. Honduras, El Salvador, particularly. And the other aspect is that there is very little indication that very rich individuals have found a reason in the pandemic to support redistributive reforms and the concentration of worldwide resources in the hands of multinationals from the US and China primarily. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Excellent uh, figures. It confirms what Jose Antonio mentioned. We're following the same process. The structural conditions are not changing and are somehow being reinforced. Thank you, Francisco, for your paper. Thank you for joining us today. Next presentation, Leonardo. Leonardo, 
health and e economy was a little stagnant and it suddenly fell on the table and, and, and basically everyone started talking about health and how it affects the economy and it is we've seen a lot of suffering in that sense. So thank you, Leonardo, for being with us here today. As Alicia said, it is a pleasure to have you, to have the UNAM with us. You have the floor. Please tell us, not the entire paper, let's leave some space for everyone to read it. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, for a few years, I a few years back, I wasn't really dedicated to this topic. It's important to mention that my thesis, my graduation thesis had to do with this and I hadn't really revisited this. Uh, I had written something about it nine years ago. I think that was the last time that I reflected on the health system and the healthcare system in Mexico. So you will quickly see that although there was an effort to increase the expenditure in health in Mexico in the last few years, it was insufficient because of the shortcomings that the system had from the past. Of course, there is um, a lot to be researched in this sense, and there's many things that are interesting in this situation. We know that there is imperfect competition in all markets, which is related to health, we have seen this. There's markets that produce medication and there's these oligopolic um, medication and equipment. And we see the production of masks, for example, where the prices skyrocketed or they simply weren't available. There needs to be uh, an effort to export and replace and recover uh, capabilities that there once were in the region in Mexico. For example, in the 60s and 70s, there was production of vaccines. And right now, vaccines are strategic, and we need to remember that they have a very important aspect. V vaccines can be seen as a positive externality because they wouldn't really cover the entire population without these free vaccination, uh, free and va compulsory vaccination schemes. And so re research in health would not have sufficient results if it wasn't partly um, covered by the state. There are some macroeconomic aspects that are quite clear and that have been studied in the last few decades. For example, the relationship between the expenditure on health and how it affects the economic growth. Finally, access to health as a variable that um, affects the income distribution. And finally, funding health as a macroeconomic variable. We see that the total expenditure in health, public and private, has a proportion, significantly increasing proportion of the GDP. And we see the expenditure in health in the selected countries. We see uh, higher mortality in medium income countries. We we understand that health is expensive in these countries. And Mexico, for example, has made a low expenditure in health as compared to the GDP. It has a bad distribution of the expenditure. Around 51% is public expenditure and the rest is private expenditure of which 41% or actually 80% of private expenditure is in the is by the homes and the rest is in catastrophic um, situations. So there's a very low expenditure in public health, which are the volunteer programs, voluntary programs. And the public expenditure in health, if we compare it to developed countries, as is the case of Europe and also Latin America, I, I wouldn't really need to clarify it. It is the lowest line. Mexico is there in the light blue. The yellow line is Latin America and the dark blue line is Europe. We see that 
there has been a significant increase in this century as a percentage of public expenditure in health in the rest of Latin America compared to Mexico. In Mexico, the increase in public expenditure in health as a total has oscillated and in Europe tends to remain stable. So there's been a greater effort in Latin America. Despite that, there was a significant attempt to increase public expenditure in health in the last few years. We see that um, between 97 and 2013, there was an, uh, this effort. And then after that, there has been some stagnation. We see a recovery around, as I said, around 2012, but the beginning of this government, we also saw a little slight increase, but again, it is stagnated. This has to do with the fiscal policies and sufficient collections. And this is reflected in health infrastructure. We are well below these figures in Latin America and, uh, for example, Turkey. And needless to say, compared to other developed countries here, where we have hospitals per million inhabitants, we see also that there's a number of smaller hospitals distributed throughout the national territory, which and public hospitals. And this has a significant disadvantage because they are hospitals that are not well equipped. So that basically reproduces inequality throughout the healthcare system in detriment of the more vulnerable sectors. This is worsened by the demographic transition experienced in Mexico. There's many other countries in Latin America that are undergoing a similar scheme. We see the population is aging. Uh, this is the information for 2010. We already have the information for 2020. It will soon be available. And we see an increase of the aging of the population over 60, and this is going to put greater pressure on the healthcare system. In this graph, we see how the population from five to 14 years of age is decreasing, that's the yellow line, and 75 plus is increasing consistently and 62, 74, even more. To this, we need to add the fact that there's a vulnerable population in Mexico due to lack of access to health and social security. Last year in Mexico, 20 billion people did not have access to health care services and 71 billion don't have access to social security and 2.4 doc there's 2.4 doctors for every 1000 people. This situation is further complicated by the characteristics of the population. We have three quarters of the population with uh, obesity, and we have a very high prevalence of diabetes, around 10%. And to this, we need to add the fact that the public services are not um, adequate. So those who don't have Social Security and are covered by the public systems have um, insufficient coverage and the public system has also disappeared in the last few decades. It has been substituted by the INSAVI, the Institute of Health and Well-Being, INSAVI. So in Mexico, there are insufficient resources and we are not able to address all these shortcomings. Mexico had already uh, presented significant lagging behind in terms of funding coverage and infrastructure in healthcare services, which make that the lack of access to healthcare is one of the main determinants of poverty and social inequality. And there is a need for a sustained effort to increase health uh, expenditure in healthcare, especially in an emergency situation so that it can be financed with uh, debt, but in the long term, it is only sustainable with a fiscal reform. And this is, it's calling for a need to modify the public sector and thus prevent this uh, inequality. There is space for international cooperation for the production of vaccines 
as Alicia said, we have the capacity in Mexico. There was once a significant contribution to vaccine production in the 60s and 70s, even part of the 80s. We can recover that. It is ECLAC's proposal to form a Latin American consortium, and there is space to continue to improve imports and exports in those sectors linked to um, vaccines and other health care equipment. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. As we mentioned earlier, this topic goes, it returns uh, or is recurring really in a very significant manner. At ECLAC, we realize that the economy in healthcare is of the utmost importance and building a strategic regional system that could produce and somehow try to recover those capacities that the region once had. They don't anymore. The production of vaccines and generic medication is extremely an extremely important idea and it would be associated with welfare and uh, production on the other hand. So thank you very much, Leonardo. We would now like to move on to Maria Savona. It's a pleasure. Thank you for being with us here today. And you have something else to share with us, the digital aspects of all this. Everyone has said, has met, they have mentioned many things, but we realize that there are no public policies that actually uh, function properly. And Maria is um, a collaborator of ECLAC, and it is a pleasure to have you here. You have the floor for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia and Mario. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I, I will be speaking in English to make things a little easier. So, um, so th this is what I would like to uh, highlight. So it's, it's more of a general discussion. It's an extraction of my uh, article for La Revista. And uh, uh, so it's more of a reflection on the future of work on labor markets linked to uh, the effect of pandemics. So, well, first of all, uh, I think one major um, uh, emergency is mental health. <laughs> I would like to uh, stress these issues because ideally, when we started writing for this special issue, there was the, there was the first wave and everyone was uh, uh, inclined to think we're going to go back to normal and we're going to go back to physical interaction. And now in the second wave, we're going to have re-entering anxiety. So something related, what am, what am I going to do with physical interaction in the second wave? So this is more of a general issue. So one of the... Um, uh, public health issue linked to what Leonardo was saying is surely it's gonna be related to how to tackle this giant post-traumatic stress disorders for, for the globe related to, uh, uh, to uh, the effect of the pandemics. But this leads me to narrow down a little bit more on uh, um, the labor markets, which is what interests me in this, in this context, I think. I think it's important to highlight that uh, um, this issue of physical versus digital interaction, so how the effect of the pandemics is intertwined with the, the impact of digital on labor markets. So the, the, the sort of keywords to me here are what is the extent of digital interaction and what are the, the, the distinction between essential versus non-essential jobs. And this is what the pandemics is changing the shape of this, of this uh, uh, difference. So the question that I think are very much applied as well to the Latin American context, I think are more general, is what are the categories more at risk? And this links with what Benedicte was also uh, considering, but mostly whether wages reflect the extent of essentiality. So there are essential jobs, there are new essential jobs that reflect poorly on wages. And more in general, what can we um, uh, forecast in terms of current and future trends on, the, on whether we're gonna go back to physical work or whether we're gonna remain totally digital or what is the sort of hybrid uh, 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 share of work. 
and also what to do about it. So that's, uh, that's my question uh, uh, related that I tried to put in the paper. So on this issue that I'm borrowing a paper uh, by Maria del Rio Cianona and, and other authors, I think is very nice. It came up last year and what they're trying to do is to classify the kind of jobs and activities based on the extent to which they are uh, digitalizable. So the fractional work activity that can be performed at home or are digitalizable, where, and also the extent to which they are essential. And the essentiality is related to how these activities serve the other parts of the economy. And if you can see here, what, uh, uh, what they have is, is a sort of distinction between those most vulnerable, there are those that are not at all digitalizable, so they are exposed, they need to go physically uh, 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 at work, and are also not much essential. So this is the segment of the labor markets that is more at risk vis-a-vis uh, uh, sort of uh, jobs that are uh, highly skilled services to, to some extent essential and also fully digitalizable. And as you can see here, this is related also to the, uh, to the wage difference. And obviously, if, we, if, if these are the segments, the effect of the shocks of the pandemics on the labor market is very much uh, 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 sort of um, polarizing even more. So this is something that we need to take into account that I think in, in general, and is a sort of exacerbation of the pandemic's effect on, uh, on, on the labor market. And this is what I think it's important to reflect upon. So my main reflection in this, in this paper is this, this sort of the oxymoron of essentiality. Because I think that what are uh, essential jobs, so, so what are, for example, uh, those that are non-digitalizable are also those jobs that are at the bottom of the wage distribution. And being, for example, I've been for, for many decades now uh, interested in, uh, in the economics of services, and I was thinking about the, the sort of ironical uh, destiny that the essential services have had in the pandemics. There are those that are most unsuited for remote working, they're most unsuited for, for innovation potential, they're low skilled, they are ironically the spreaders of the Bomolian cost disease, the famous cost disease of Bomol that would consider services as dragging down productivity. Uh, and therefore being uh, a detriment to the economy. And yet in the pandemics, these are the services that uh, maintain the function, the minimal function of the economies uh, in the first wave. So my first reflection is the extent to which as economists, we should reflect on, on, the, on how wages uh, poorly uh, uh, reflect the essentiality of the job. So much of the uh, wage structure and the way wage are formed is based on, uh, on uh, this idea of productivity. And ideally, this is a confirmation that productivity might be a mismeasurement when it comes to uh, underpin the wage formation, when instead we should be considering some form of essentiality uh, or, or well-being to, um, to commensurate wages. So ideally, in, in a context of emergency, uh, there are some essential services that might be considered collective goods, and therefore uh, a, a reflection on, on wages should be, um, uh, should, it, it, it must, might be valuable. The other uh, thing that I would like to point out is the um, future of this. So, this is an interesting, I think, sort of interesting Microsoft report that came up a few um, uh, days ago, and they look at what is the next great disruption for the future of work, is that hybrid work, and are we ready to, um, to embrace this hybrid work in, in a post-pandemic world? Uh, and this, so they come up with a sort of uh, trends, but I would like you to pick upon a couple of this. And these are, for example, the idea of uh, what hybrid work would entail in the future would be possibly a higher productivity of very uh, uh, privileged services, but also 
an exhausted workforce. So something that digital exhaustion is something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and also on the other extreme is also the idea that uh, uh, counting on dig or fully dig digitalizing some of the work might have a long-term effect, for example, on, on the innovation potential. So the extent to which if we uh, eliminate for our, from our jobs any social interaction, any face-to-face uh, -face interaction, what is the long-term effect on, for example, on innovation potential? And this is something that also um, Andy Aldain has, has uh, really put in perspective in a, a few months ago, saying that ideally uh, this idea of fully digitalizing some of the work might have, uh, might uh, dampen creative sparks and having a long-term effect on, uh, on innovation. So probably, this is something that also uh, we might take into account when we reflect on the post-pandemic future work uh, 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 context. So ideally, I think, I'm, and I'm gonna um, stop here. I think if we really need to think uh, maybe bold uh, uh, in, in a post-pandemic world, I think that, um, where do we need to direct public funds? I mean, surely there are uh, that there is a lot of effort that has been, for example, in Europe, a, a lot of uh, the furlough schemes that have supported jobless people and so on in emergency. But I think a more structural um, intervention would be uh, trying to understand, for example, what are the effect, the long-term effect on in terms of digital exhaustion and mental health. And I think a lot of this could be uh, usefully, uh, uh, a lot of public funds could be usefully used for that. Uh, the second point is, is, is sort of rethinking this connection between wage structure and this idea of, of essentiality of jobs and maybe uh, detach the wage formation from this myth of productivity and maybe reframe the productivity <laughs> issues in a different way precisely because we are able to learn these lessons from this emergency uh, and also reflect from, as being an innovation scholar for me is, a, is an interesting point to reflect to the extent to which um, long-term innovation potential might be disrupted by uh, fully digitalizing uh, labor markets. So, so this is something possibly a more uh, long-term perspective on, uh, on uh, what the post-pandemic context might be. But thank you for, for listening. Uh, muchas gracias. Gracias, Maria. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Maria. Employment, wages, you know, one often thinks that we continue to look at productivity in a traditional sense. And of course it is a completely different and uncertain change. And the, the changes behind production, social capital and so forth is very different. For Latin America, of course, this is crucial. Having policies that do not see or envision the new scenario is a replication of the issues that we were unable to solve in the past. So thank you very much, Maria. That is a very interesting line of research. Again, thank you very much for that contribution. We have another very important topic ahead of us, which is macroeconomic policy changes in Central America. Juan Carlos and Rodrigo will be presenting the paper that has to do with these changes in Central America. And as Maria Alicia has, has said, the question is, where is ECLAC, where, where do we stand in terms of the discussion for development and the topic of immigration and so forth is a very important one. And in this regard, we often think about how we might be able to help in processes, how we can have an impact on these topics. And this is what they address in the paper. It is a pleasure to have you here. It is a pleasure to be here with you. And we, I'm very happy to be a part of this group. I am the material author. He's the intellectual author. 
Can you see the screen? This is like those family meetings. Can you hear me? And yes, I can. Anyway, the, we have just been presented several other graphs and I believe that Maria's graphs are much nicer than ours, but uh, this is a Salvadoran artist. It is called Mi Pueblo by Camilo Minero. Central America, the initial point or the starting point would be where was Central America in the past? It has many different issues, but it found a moderate economic growth, 2.5% average in 2019 with a public debt of 47.5 GDP average also during 2019. But we have a lot of informality, a high level of poverty. And my friend Leonardo, the Mexican health care system said that this situation is much more serious in Central America. And of course, uh, weakening of the institutional mechanisms in the region, the internal and external mechanisms, as we've heard many times here at ECLAC, is that well, COVID is not just a, a demand shock. There is also this uh, rupture in expectations and in many other aspects. <clears throat> there are confinement measures and there's many uh, impacts on the economy. In terms of the indicators <clears throat> in Latin America and the region, well, as you can see, we tend to speak of Central America, Costa Rica and Panama. We see the remittances are not significant, but if you take a look at the openness to exports in these countries is even much higher than in the others. Tourism, except for the case of Costa Rica, is higher in Panama, and remittances, as we said, is 20, 21 percent. So all this crashed, except remittances, which later recovered. This is the classic graph of options for public policies, the macro uh, credit. And there are some additional ones that specifically the macro measures have to do with the labor market. And all this shows us that Nicaragua is in silence in many aspects, and we really don't know what is happening. Unfortunately, in the rest of the region, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica, we see it's all over the place. If it were Sudoku, we would have finished already. It's all the instruments that we find. And we realize that the region is being strongly hit. There's the idea that there will be economic recovery from 2019 to 2023 in Nicaragua from 2017 to 2024. However, the impact is significant. Central America, it would seem did not do that uh, badly. It dropped 6.4% versus Latin America and the Caribbean that dropped 7.7. But it really depends how we were doing before. Central America was growing at 2.5. So if it drops 6.4, it is significant. For us, it's almost nine percentual points difference between 2019 and 2020. Costa Rica, 6.9. Salvador is 11 points. Guatemala, 6.3. I will leave Nicaragua aside and Panama, 14.0. And Latin America, 7.8. So it is a strong economic impact. Economists always tend to say that we don't like this level, so we go to the next derivative, and if not the second one. and things are not moving along as quickly and then we start to feel better. Poverty has been studied at length by ECLAC and if the GDP drops, then there's greater poverty and it takes, uh, there's a long road ahead for recovery. And we have, of course, begun with very low levels. Inequality, and I really like the approach of several of our colleagues that speak of the alarming gender inequalities, among many others. It's unacceptable. Now, in Central America, the response in expenditure, as we see here in the green line, is very 
different among the, the countries. We have 0 0.3 for Costa Rica and the fiscal deficit has increased and in public debt as well. From the ethical perspective, we see the GDP coefficient. Some countries spent a little and they raised their public debt by 11 points. So when you're trying to correct the GDP and you focus only on the numerator, it will be a disaster. And as you can see, if it falls 10% down, the quotient is spantos. Este, en política fiscal es, es largo el menú que hacemos en el, en el documento, una, una, bueno, sobre todo eh, Rodrigo, muy exhaustivo metiéndonos a los programas, eh, planes de desarrollo, planes fiscales, todo. Lo que se ve es apoyos fiscales a diestra y siniestra, el, el LCR, en el IVA, a empresas, a personas, transferencias a las MIPIMES, a sectores productivos, a los pobres y a los nuevos y viejos pobres, y otras medidas de atención, controles de precios. En todos los países se pusieron controles de precio a los productos de la canasta básica y también hubo intervención directa en el mercado laboral. Y bueno, los grandes desafíos, los grandes desafíos, como decía Previch, este, no es que vivamos nuevos problemas, vivimos los viejos problemas con una gravedad acentuada. Desafíos económicos, sociales, ambientales, cito mucho el trabajo de Alicia y de ustedes, queridos colegas, o citamos, perdóname, Rodrigo, de las, de los, tra, las tres patas del desarrollo, lo económico, lo social y lo ambiental, y las tres tasas de crecimiento que pues no... No, no empata, no embonan, la contracción económica de las más grandes, la restricción externa imperante y además con lo que mencionaba Alicia al principio, el pago de servicio de la deuda, ya no solo hay que hablar de restricciones externas en tipo comercial, sino también financieras, ¿dónde vamos a pagar esas tasas de interés o esos inter intereses después ya no se dirán? So we have the interest of the financial architecture and poverty and inequality the migration of human rights, et cetera, and greater long and short-term impacts, the gaps in education, in health, in social protection is expanding by the minute. And of course, we have the blue skies of stagnation. You go out and breathe it in, and eventually it starts to smoke again. So recovery will have these high levels of emission, but we, the decarbonization, is going to allow us to comply with the or meet these environmental agreements. It's not about being in or out. It needs to be sustainable. The interaction of all three dimensions must mark this development agenda. And uh, my dear Jose Antonio, the truth is that this, we've made some noise. And it, uh, those who say that uh, the size doesn't matter, haven't slept in a room with a mosquito. And the World Bank and others have still, um, uh, are still offering sources of financing. Some have not paid. And I would like to say that sometimes things are approved, but they're not executed. And the BC, we do approve and execute. So the Central American um, monetary policies have done very well and have allowed harmonizing fiscal policies if we want to move towards, and Alicia's laughing. Uh, of course, you know, you know that there's that little detail, that tiny little detail that will help it make it possible. So we need to revitalize and strengthen cooperation and integration initiatives at a regional level as a very uh, important part of the region's strategy. In the medium term, we must articulate the national visions with the region. And I mean, in regional integration in terms of production, sustainable development, removing external uh, factors and focusing on growth. When you talk about fiscal reform, you need not only to stabilize and not only redistribution, you need to have efficient reforms with social uh, protection based on rights. And of course, it's not only about austerity policies in order to reduce the GDP debt, maybe inflation, it would be better with growth. We have said this and consensus is always positive, political facts for equality. We need to create this consensus within countries and among them, political, social and economic 
players in order to redesign this regional development agenda. The international community cannot be absent, it cannot be a mere observer. So again, Mi Pueblo by Camilo Minero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you very much, Alicia. You have the floor. I mean, we could talk for two days, but unfortunately, we're not able to. Right, I wanted to hear comments from all of you. I believe we have excellent material on this uh, issue of the magazine. Jose Antonio, I really enjoyed your comparison of the health crisis to the previous crises, the Great Depression, the Asian crisis, the North Atlantic crisis. I believe that it's extremely important and you offer us the opportunity to analyze the shocks associated with uh, external funding, the terms of trade and remittances that, as you have said, have had less significant impacts. But you did mention something that I found very interesting, which is the lack of international cooperation and financing. I believe that we need to solve a series of internal issues. That is the key of why Latin America and the Caribbean finds itself in the situation it does. Uh, because of this poor performance, we have macro growth and we have policies in many aspects, but I believe that international symmetry is not helping. And I would say that the international community has left out the middle income companies from all these formulas for funding and development that are being sought. And I believe in the region, this is worse because the risk uh, qualifiers are reducing our rating. And although it's true that there's internal structural issues, I believe that uh, in the face of greater debt in the region and payments, we are we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. I believe that uh, this is a great document. I was a, I worked with you on the citizenship and equality document, which was a precursor, I think, and had offered a wonderful vision and NECLAC started to build its documents on equality and structural change on that. And we should truly include the environmental aspects as part of economic development. It was always seen as an externality and now even the monetary fund will have new externalities related with climate change. Here comes the IMF with its pro-climate change or pro-climate uh, action policies. So very well, thank you very much, Jose Antonio Benedict, how important your topic is. Thank you, Jose Antonio, as always. Thank you very much. I, I know you need to leave us. Benedict, it's so important to study the elite. This is extremely important. Thank you very much for your perspective. Well, together with Francisco Rodríguez. thank you very much. And I think it's of the utmost importance to see how we are doing. We always go and observe extreme poverty, but now we need to study the elite because they are becoming wealthier. And this is increasingly in our debate, there is this solidary tax that is being implemented at a global scale and it is uh, to uh, assist and finance the pandemic. I believe it's temporary and it's a single uh, tax and it will eventually go to financing the vaccines. But the most important thing is to create taxes, uh, income taxes, higher income taxes and taxes on wealth. I would like to invite you to look at this more closely because we will see greater inertia and wealth concentration in the elite. And Francisco Robles also mentioned this very clearly. I believe that these transfers 
to the elite and the elite uh, economic groups, they are the main winners in this situation. When the world is talking about taxing the multinational, digital multinational companies, our region is taking it away. It's uh, incredible. So we should pay attention to this and on and to how the elites need to respond to this tax. They speak of philanthropy. So that was very interesting, a very interesting perspective, Benedict and Francisco Robles. Leonardo, your paper is extremely interesting, your presentation as well, because you, it's music for our ears. Basically, ECLAC, uh, upon request of CELAC in Mexico, requested that we present a plan to study the technological and industrial capacities of the region to produce vaccines. And the UNAM was present in a meeting held by CELAC where the capacities of Mexico were analyzed. And that's what they said, there was this capacity in the 60s and 70s and it was lost. And then other countries came along, Costa Rica, Brazil, Argentina. The region needs to recover this ability and capacity to produce its own vaccines, its own medical equipment. We cannot depend on others and, and, and not simply produce generic medication. That's what our industry has um, shifted towards. We are extremely interested in continuing to work on this topic with you. We will continue and address this request by CELAC. It gives us a great perspective of several things, not only the industrial uh, pharmaceutical complexes, but also the healthcare system, which is the demand to a certain extent, isn't it? And how demand responds to this issue and how what you need to do in both senses. So very important. And we are working to move towards a Latin American consortium for industrial production and research. And I think these two things go hand in hand in research and development. Maria Savona, thank you for arguing on behalf of this consideration of the new essential things about the exhaustion, I think, digital exhaustion. We are all exhausted, I have to say. But on the other hand, about the importance of mental health and, and, and the concept of the new essentiality of the jobs we are not paying we are not paying the price for the essential jobs that's that's the bottom line this society has to move into a care society that it, it's really and and we have to protect women here you know because women are essential by the way in this uh, in this notion of essentiality and many of them are not paid this is what we call the non-paid uh, domestic work of women that have to return to do that. But, but we're talking about essential jobs in all fronts and they are the precarious, the bottom, and, and we need to, to do something there, really, really. I think you, you posted uh, something that is really so interesting. Uh, Maria, thank you, thank you, thank you. Y, y, y quisiera, bueno, por supuesto, eh, creo que eh, tuvimos... Of course. We've also had an opportunity to hear about the panorama in Central America that Juan Carlos Moreno has brought to us, obviously a topic that you have worked on extensively. We do have, and of course, as you know, we have very close ties to the Central American integration system. And we are so very sorry that we have not been able to strengthen that Central American integration as we should. And in a certain extent, the presence of China in the region has really led to a downturn in Central America production, which was the pillar of the SMEs. And of course, Central America is so hard hit by political divergence, as Jose Antonio was saying. 
the we are become we need to be more pragmatic in our response to the pandemic, less political, because certainly in Central America, it is worth talking about the vaccines. For example, on April 23rd, Pajo noted that the vaccines arriving, it is a very low level, 13 per 100 people in Panama, nine in Belize, nine in the Dominican Republic, and one, almost two in Nicaragua, 0.9 in Guatemala, and 0.6 in El Salvador. What are we talking about here? If we're talking about creating in the world islands of immunity, is that what we're talking about? And the efforts in Central America and the problems of coronavirus and so forth. But as Ogo is saying, we have to look at this from the structural vision, from a profound approach, addressing the structural issues for the low growth, for the low productivity, for fiscal returns. All of this is contributing to the massive exodus of young people, women, of course, in northern Central America, northward, of course, and the south Nicaragua, south into Costa Rica. And from Nicaragua, southward is the trend. And that exodus has to speak to us because there is an exhaustion of the Central American pact. There is a disenchantment among the Central American people. So I think there is certainly much to be done. ECLAC has a lot to do. And certainly when we're talking about the comprehensive plan for Central America, obviously we're seeing a change in US policy. We'll see if that helps development in that region a bit more. In sum, I'd like to say it's been a fabulous event. I want to thank everyone for their contributions. Miguel Torres, and he is the true editor. Mario and I are just the minor contributors. We hope that it has been helpful, but I do invite you all to read all 14 articles because I believe that this issue of CEPAL review will have a tremendous impact. You've given us ideas that will help feed our work in service of the region. So thank you very much. I send you a huge hug and greetings. And thank you once again for being with us here today. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Francisco. I didn't name you, but thank you as well. Thank you. 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 Th